Welcome to Gone Fishing, a show diving into the cybersecurity threats that surround our highly connected lives. Every human is different. Every person has unique vulnerabilities that expose them to potentially successful social engineering. On this show, we'll discuss human vulnerability and how it relates to unique individuals. I'm Connor Swam, CEO of FinSecurity, and welcome to Gone Fishing. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Gone Fishing. If you've listened to the show for a few episodes, you'll know that I'm very passionate about the phrase I've dubbed human vulnerability management. I've invited Wes Spencer, one of my favorite people on this planet, back, who was on our last episode. And we're going to discuss specifically what's the intersection between cyber insurance and human vulnerability management. Wes, thanks for coming back again. Anytime, my friend. You know it. So can you give us a quick refresher in the last episode. Where does security awareness training, I'll, I'll say that here because that's what most people know it as, and, and cyber insurance, where do those interact with each other? So the carriers have finally woken up to, if we train our people and they understand why these breaches happen and how they happen and that you have a role to play in it, we can reduce the likelihood quite a bit. Both the, the occurrence percentage and what I call the blast radius, like how bad an attack could actually be. It's astounding when you think about how many people are involved, like the human is involved in pretty much, I mean, can you name a breach that a human's not involved in these days? I can't. Um, and so they finally woken up to this and like, hello, if you don't have this in place, why should we take a risk on insuring you if you're not going to train your own people around this? That makes a lot of sense. You, you mentioned that cyber insurance carriers are waking up to this fact that humans are increasingly so becoming involved, or uh, I will use a slew of phrases of which I'm not 100% uh, you know, bought into, but involved, the cause of, the reason for. I've seen all of those in articles on LastPass's breaches, on Kaseya's breaches, on every breach I've seen. It's like, oh, you know, somebody wags the finger at a human. It's like they made a mistake. And cyber insurance carriers are waking up to this. Is that accurate? It, it is accurate. And it's shocking to me that it, they didn't wake up to that quicker and sooner. They should have all along. But yeah, they, they're recognizing the commonality that exists here, which is simply this. Look, if you are not training your people, then that's a huge security hole that exists that should never have happened in the first place. And Connor, I, I, when I look at all the breaches that I have seen and read about and even personally dealt with, there's always a person involved, always, 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 whether it's the phishing email that comes in, it's something they click on, it was their inability to report it to somebody like it, there's always a person involved. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One thing I've been kind of wrestling with is the concept is, is technology becoming more secure? Or are humans becoming more insecure? And depending upon, you know, if I go to New York Times, and I'm scrolling through today's headlines, you know, I waffle back and forth, but I'd be interested to hear your opinion on that. Well, there's an old quote I'm going to butcher uh, that says something along the lines of like computers are getting like faster and smarter every day. And but yet humans are becoming more and more stupid every single day. And so far, like humans are winning the, the race or whatever. Right. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true or not, but I just think that I just see the problem over and over because I have so many client conversations and usually they're all in the same boat. Like they know that breaches, you see them on TV, but you don't really relate them to yourself and you just see them from afar. And so when you look at them, you're like, oh, that's for Bank of America to worry about. Or if they do think it could happen to them because they've had a friend that's gone through one, they misunderstand just how damaging a breach can be. They think, oh, I mean, ask them. Like, here's, here's a takeaway. Go ask your clients. Hey, if you had a breach, how much do you think it would cost? You're going to hear staggering numbers like, oh, probably 50,000, maybe 100,000 at the most. Like, I couldn't possibly see it being more than that, right? They're totally unaware. And so because they're unaware, they're not prepared to take action on something that they don't think is a problem. So we actually have to reverse this and really help them understand what we're defending against. And then when they understand that, then they'll want to invest the time and understanding to be knowledgeable against that threat. And that's usually the problem is we put carts in front of horses when it comes to the client and the people side of cybersecurity. You mentioned um, cyber insurance carriers are essentially asking the question, well, or stating, if you're not willing to train your folks and we're not willing to insure you, what are some of the pieces of that training now? I could dive into this, but I'd love to ask you, what are some of the pieces that you see 
uh, of training that you see cyber insurance carriers or that you see MSPs or the clients you work with actually focusing on? So right now, it's keep in mind, just the carrier's not doing the greatest job in the world at, at really hardly anything when it comes to security, right? So what they are doing, which is good, and I'll commend them for this, is they're going to ask questions like, do you train every single user in your organization around cybersecurity and its importance? And then you say yes or no, and then it's going to ask you the cadence. And they at least want to see that you train them once a year, which I'm just sort of like, that is so archaic. Like, in Connor, I know that makes you like squirm thinking like this archaic old school, like, where's your one training for the year? Boom, there you go. Versus continuous <laughs> education. But and then the other thing that they ask, and I want to get your commentary on that. The other thing they ask is, do you do you actually test them? And same thing. Do you do it once a year? Do you do it quarterly? And that's usually about the breakup. And so that's their view right now is like, right. we at least want to start there. But you and I both know it could be way better, right? It could be infinitely better in my estimation. So this whole concept of, of human vulnerability management is going way beyond your yearly trainings. Like you mentioned, your yearly tests. The, oh, this is clearly a phishing email forwarded around to all your friends and say, don't click on this. This is the fish. If we go way beyond that and do what I believe would be the right thing, which is to actually simulate the real world to say, OK, if someone was trying to gain access to this company, what would they do? They go on LinkedIn, they look up the employees, they try to figure out who works with who on a regular basis. They might simulate business email compromise. They would do something more uh, particular and more relevant to that specific client. And that was my initial thought around human vulnerability management as well. What if we did this on a consistent basis to keep up with the real world, you know, as it changes day by day? And what if we actually made it relevant to the client and simulated what they are most likely willing to face and what is most likely going to result in a successful breach if it worked? What if we simulated that? That was where kind of we started. That's red hot, man, because like the old school mantra is like you said, let me just test periodically and, and that's why I'm doing it. Versus like, I, I won't name names, Connor, but someone that you know might have sent me a phishing email that I clicked on a while back. And uh, you know what, darn it, I still remember that. And to this day, I'm like, you know what, I'm glad I got fished on that because I'm a cybersecurity guy. It's what I do. And I can be fished. It's so healthy. The real goal is like what you just said, let's simulate the real life and let's celebrate failures so that I can be aware and be like, oh man, that got me good. Like, I'm really glad that I'm thinking about this and it's front of mind and I'm worried about it and I'm concerned about it. That's the goal is to build what we call the awareness piece, that huge A part of, of, of uh, SAT, right? And so yeah. I just, I really agree. The point is not to be like, we're going to do these minimums and make sure we do it. No, it's all about let's, let's be like real world here. Yeah. And I know you, you remember this from some of your banking days, but I still run across uh, partners who have clients where they'll, they're tie people's compensation to their performance on phishing tests. And speaking from experience, guaranteeing that an email gets to an end user's inbox unscathed, unlooked at by Microsoft or Barracuda or any kind of web filter or secure mail gateway is nearly impossible 100% of the time. So these employees start freaking out. They start to believe their cyber team is punishing them. They start to hate the people on the security team and uh, just creates such a horrible dynamic between what should essentially be a role of the individual and then the supporting team, which is the cyber people, making sure that people are safe. Yeah, I, I agree. I'll just say this is, you know, we, we security people always talk about how to be less adversarial. And then we go and we shoot ourselves in the foot by having these very adversarial approaches that you just mentioned around, um, you know, like, you, oh, you got punished for this. I don't understand it. And it's such a bad way to go. It, it throws in the face everything we're trying to accomplish with the far better culture. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, I mean, it even gets down to the once a year training that's four hours long. And it's like, listen, I don't know who's listening to this as a cyber practitioner, but here is reality. The average employee just wants to show up to their job, do great work, and be safe while doing it. Hammering them over the head with these videos that are hours long if it's for a year at a time, it's just not, it's not cutting it at this point. Every employee I've ever talked to personally has said the exact same thing. They'll take, I'm looking at you right now, I'll move you to my second monitor. And I will play with my dog, my cat, say hi to my spouse, my kids, whatever it is. I'll take a walk while that plays in the background and I'll come back and I'll answer the questions. And if I get it wrong, oh, I'll just <laughs> rinse and repeat, answer again with different answers and I'm good to go. And so, uh, you know, I always say two things happen in that scenario. The employee got no additional learning and you paid for it. So, yeah, absolutely. 
Well, thanks, Wes. This has been an amazing discussion. I always love chatting with you. And I definitely want to have you back. Anytime. Um, maybe next time we can dig into a specific breach or maybe we won't name names. We don't need to name names. But I'd love to figure out, is there anything we can learn or anything the listeners can learn about a specific breach? Is that something you'd like to do? Oh, I got a good one. Oh, now you're making me wish we could record another one. So um, anyway, thanks so much for that, Wes. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you want to find out more about creating a high-quality awareness training program that actually engages the employees to change their habits, then check us out at FinSecurity at FinSec.io or click the link in the show notes. I'm Connor, CEO at Fin. Thanks again for joining me on Gone Fishing, and I'll see you next time.